thank you for being um, I want to thank everyone who's made an effort to come here on Monday morning and clothing in the snow uh, and tell you that from my perspective, it's a privilege to be able to talk uh, here in Albany to this kind of a group. Uh, as Courtney said, I have a little bit of background here in New York State and in Albany, and so it's, it's great to be back and to be able to talk to a group that actually is interested in public policy on this type of an issue. Um, this is an important issue, not just for the state of New York, but for New Yorkers. And it, it's an issue that 20 years ago, when I first got engaged in the long-term care issue, this was an issue about our parents. It was an issue about the World War II generation and their retirement needs. Today, this issue is about us. It's about pre-retirement baby boomers. And what I'm going to talk about is how part of the market here has changed. And I'm going to talk about many of the things, same things that Mark talked about, except for with a little bit of a different twist from a private insurance company perspective. Um, there's a lot to be said on this topic. And in, in the hour and a half session we've got here, we can only kind of scrape the surface of it. Uh, what you, you should come away from here today is sort of what's a, a taste of what is long-term care, what is long-term care insurance. Uh, what I want to point out, and, and I hope you'll hear through what I have to say, this is a young business. Um, it's a business that from the perspective of a private insurance industry has only about 35 years of experience. From the perspective of the state of New York, there's really only about 20 years of experience in dealing with long-term care insurance. So what I want to share with you are some of the learnings that we've had as a private company and many of those learnings here in the state of New York. From Genworth Financial's perspective, New York State is our second most important state for doing business. California, um, you know, one out of eight Americans being in California. California is our most important state. It's the largest state we're in right business. But nonetheless, New York is our second most important state. It always has been and continues to be through 2010. Um, what, what, what Mark um, talked about here, and, and th th this is very similar to what, what Mark just discussed, with respect to types of long-term care, um, that, you know, as, as we talked about previously, we have home care, we have assisted living, we have adult uh, daycare, we have health, we have, that last one should be home, I am sorry, it is home care. Um, these are all things that are covered under a long-term care insurance policy. Long-term care insurance policies started out as nursing home coverage only, and today any policy that you buy in the marketplace is going to cover long-term care services in any of those types of settings. Likewise, as Mark pointed out, there are really three ways to pay for long-term care services. One is to pay out of pocket, the other is to pay through a private insurance policy, and the third is to pay out of pocket until you end up on Medicaid. Um, what we have is a tremendous amount of claims data, and I'm going to share some of that with you as we go through this. We thought early on we were writing nursing home policies, and we thought that we were paying for frailty. Instead, what we've learned in terms of paying long-term care services is we're paying for home care, and we're paying about half the dollars we spend out for Alzheimer's. So it's important to understand that what we've got here is an issue about planning, we've got here an issue about caregivers, and we have an issue about uh, Alzheimer's. Now, why do people buy long-term care insurance? They buy it for two main reasons. One is to provide choices, so you can spend the dollars under a long-term care insurance policy in the settings that are most appropriate, and the second is in order to not be a burden on your family. What we've seen in terms of long-term care insurance sales is that 15 years ago, the average age of a purchaser was 67. Today, that average age is 57. And when you talk to somebody who's buying this policy, chances are they've dealt with a family member. They've dealt with a parent or an in-law, and they know what it's like to be a caregiver and try to assemble the network that you need in order to provide care and to deal with the cost of long-term care. Um, long-term care Facts, just sort of some nationwide <coughs> issues here. Uh, we have 80 million aging baby boomers, and Mark's at the, at the tail end, I'm kind of in the middle, and we've got some people who are already at, at, at the forefront of that. Um, we expect to see 12 million Americans needing long-term care by the year 2020, and when you look at the costs of care, these are very similar to the numbers that Mark just used. Uh, we, we sourced ours as sort of our Genworth claims data, but they back up exactly what Mark just said. 
Um, when when we, we, we at Genworth have done an annual cost of care survey, we've got seven years of data where what we do is we go out and do what Mark had his staff do at the end of last week, which is actually make phone calls. Um, we've got a group of people who do this for us, and what we do is we, we've created a study that we publish each year, and we've learned that the data in that study has exceeded our ability to publish. It started out as a staple booklet. It's now a bound booklet of over 100 pages. All of our data is accessible on the Genworth.com website, where, for example, for the state of New York, we've got a page that looks like that, looks like that up there. And we, we have 18 different regions in the state of New York. So we can show you anywhere from Long Island to various parts of upstate New York. We have 400 regions of the country. So we, we survey virtually every uh, SMSA to find out what the cost of long-term care there on an annual basis. Now you can compare that over time. You can compare region to region. And you can compare it state to state. And the website actually has a couple of very interesting tools where you can take the cost of where you live today. So say you live in Albany, and say you want, you're planning on considering retiring in Florida or Florida, and you're considering retiring 15 or 20 years from now, or needing the cost of long-term care 15 or 20 years ago from now, you can actually do that on our website. So we invite you to take a look at the, the, the general cost of care website. Two things uh, I want to point out here. Mark, Mark went into uh, the difference in, in home care between the city of New York and, and uh, other parts of the state. And we discovered exactly the same thing, that, that home care in the city of New York is actually a bargain. Um, home care in the city of New York is cheaper than it is in North Dakota. And when we first saw that data, we called our researchers and said, how can this be? And it <coughs> turned out the issue of home care is an issue of supply and demand of labor. And, and that what, what you have is a major issue in home care, and we've done some writing and some work on this, is that you have a recruitment and retention of worker issue that basically needs to be addressed by um, public policy in this country. The other one that, that's an anomaly here, and I'm not sure of the answer on this one. Uh, we, for some reason, we found that a assisted living facility in Manhattan was relatively inexpensive. Now, I think the data is right, but I don't know why. And I've got to talk to our researchers to find out what happened. I only found that on Friday, and I didn't get a chance to call the researcher to find out what, what was the story behind that number. So I'm going to call that one an anomaly, but I am going to talk about you know, the facts with regard to home care and home care across the state with it being uh, less expensive in the city of New York. Um, we, Mark showed some of the costs and, and showed the cost to an individual. We look at this from a private insurance perspective, and Mark, Mark compared it to college costs. We're going to show you here what happens if you buy private insurance. Now, these are two typical purchasers who are purchasing what's in the marketplace today. Most people buying it are part of a couple. The average age is about 57, and what the typical person is buying is three years' worth of coverage. Um, this couple bought a $150 a day policy, a policy that essentially would pay out $4,500 a month in either home care or assisted living or in a nursing home setting. And what we did was we looked and said, okay, these policies stay in force somewhere in a range of 20 years. What happens when the, when the claims start being paid? Well, what happens, oops, what happens is this is how much premium they would pay over the lifetime of that policy before they need long-term care services. Here's what the policy ends up paying out. So, we look at this and say, yeah, you can, you can argue that long-term care insurance is expensive. You can say, look, somebody paying $1,500, almost $1,600 a year, or somebody paying almost $1,500 a year, you could argue that that's expensive. We're going to tell you that in terms of the payout from the policy, that you've got to balance out what benefit you get from a long-term care insurance policy. We're also going to tell you that the younger age that you buy the policy at, the much less expensive the policy is. So th this is one of the things that we've seen, which is people gravitating and looking at long-term care insurance as part of pre-retirement planning, as opposed to buying this after they're already retired. Um, long-term care insurance, I'm going to give you sort of one carrier story here. This is a general story. Um, by way of background, 
Genworth has existed in the state of New York and, and nationwide for about the last six years. We wrote policies prior to that as part of GE. We wrote them as GE Capital Assurance. Prior to that, GE had purchased his business from Amex Life, from American Express. So the policies that are in the Genworth portfolio are the old American Express policies, the Genworth policies, I'm sorry, the GE policies and the Genworth policies. Neither American Express nor GE have any interest in Genworth today. So I, what, what I do want to talk about is what we know as Genworth. Um, we've been a partner with the state of New York uh, in the partnership program. And, and Mark pointed out some of the same data that, that's here. That the state insurance department publishes a wonderful report, but they only publish it every two years. And it's posted on the insurance department's website, which is the source of most of this data. The, the insurance department is required every two years to report to the governor and to the state legislature. The data that's on that website today is 2008 data. The report was issued at the end of 2009, so it's about two years old at this point. Uh, but again, timeline, um, what we, we've seen in this state is a very slow growth in the number of carriers that participate in long-term care insurance. Uh, by um, <clears throat> 1993, there were only 10 carriers, and today there are only 18 carriers that are selling in the state. Um, there's a lot of issues with regard to working with the state insurance department, with how companies set up a New York entity, with the risk companies are willing to take, but that's an issue from a public policy perspective that needs some look. Uh, that there aren't a lot of carriers writing this product line. They're nationwide, there are about 75 or 80 carriers, but only a handful of them sell in the state. Uh, Long-term care insurance is, is heavily regulated. Um, from a New York State perspective, everything we do has to be regulated. This company has to be licensed, our agents have to be licensed, our policies have to be approved by the state insurance department, our rates have to be approved by the state insurance department, and our agents need to be trained before they go out and sell. So th there's a lot of oversight. Much of that oversight comes from things like um, the, the, the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, pr uh, provide a model for states to adopt. That model is predicated on consumer protections and that there's a lot of disclosure and a lot of requirements. Many of those disclosures and requirements have been included in federal legislation. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Act, created something called uh, Tax Qualified Long-Term Care Insurance. Uh, most policies sold today, including those sold in the state of New York, are tax qualified policies. HIPAA incorporated much of the, uh, the, the NAIC model into the consumer protections. Um, the, the Deficit Reduction Act, which was enacted uh, actually in 2006, it's called the DRA of 2005, but by the time it was signed in the law, it was 2006. Um, the DRA created partnership programs in states other than New York. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a second. And then in 2006, the Pension Protection Act created tax incentives for long-term care insurance coupled with annuities or with life insurance. So not only do you have freestanding long-term care insurance, but you also have a long-term care benefit that can be attached to a life insurance policy or to an annuity. Um, in New York State, the, again, these are numbers from the um, the, the, the State Insurance Department's report that was published at the end of last year. Um, the, the point here is that there are about 385,000 policies in force, but only six carriers represent 70% of that marketplace. So it's a very limited marketplace with the number of insurers that are participating. Um, two other things I want to make sure I mention on this day. Tax incentives and the Plan Ahead New York program. Two things that the, that the state of New York has done and done very well on is that there is a 20% tax credit today for long-term care insurance. In other words, the state of New York pays one-fifth of your long-term care insurance costs. We've been working with um, a couple of members of the state legislature, with Senator Breslin, who's in the room today, to change how that tax incentive works. When that tax incentive was first put into effect, we thought we were solving a problem with people lapsing their policies. So we thought as seniors grew older, 
that they would need some form of tax incentive in order to keep the policy in place. So that 20% tax incentive pays every year. So you buy it this year, you'll be able to use it next year and for the life of your policy. The real issue today is not people uh, lapsing their policies. It just hasn't happened. When someone buys the uh, long-term care insurance policy, they understand the value of the product and they keep it. What we work with Senator Breslin and Assemblyman Moore Elliott on is how do we change that tax credit to incent people to buy it up front. So for example, under, under this legislation, uh, in year one you get a 75% tax credit, year two you get a 50% tax credit, year three a 25% tax credit, and then year four there wouldn't be any tax credit. So we think the public policy issue is how to get somebody to buy it to begin with, not why should they keep it, keep the policy and not, and need the 20% tax credit across the board. The other thing that I want to mention is New York's very innovative Plan Ahead New York program. Um, the, the state in, incorporated um, in, I believe it was the 2004 or the 2005 budget, money to educate New Yorkers about long-term care. It created a wonderful website, it created a great PSA campaign, it created lots of information that rolled out through the state, uh, through the county offices for the aging, and what happened is, is the money for the program has run out. Uh, we think that that is a program that ought to be continued. We think there are measurable results from that program, and we think it results in people actually planning ahead and reducing the burden on state Medicaid. Uh, partnership program. Mark has talked about a lot of this. I want to talk about this from a perspective of a carrier that considered it, has considered itself to be a partner with the state of New York, with a capital P on the word partnership. Um, we've been a participant in this program from the very beginning. I, I've served on that board from uh, 1992 on, from before the first partnership policies uh, were actually issued. I've been a member and, and participated with the state on this program. We think this program is a gem. Um, we think it's an underutilized program. Uh, the program, when it was initiated, was an experiment. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation gave money to New York, Connecticut, Indiana, and California. Gave them grant money to figure out how do you mesh long-term care insurance with Medicaid. <clears throat> and what, what the program did was to create credibility for long-term care insurance. One of the most important factors was somebody buying long-term care partnership policies was the fact that the state of New York said that this program was okay, that this program had a special blessing. The program was actually set up with sort of three contracts. There's a contract between the state and the carrier. There's a contract between the carrier and the, the insured. And there's actually a, an agreement between the state of New York and the insured. So you've got sort of a three-part agreement here that really did set up a partnership program. This program in, in 1992 and 1993 forced the, the companies to do things they weren't normally doing. We weren't writing home care at that time. We, we thought, again, that this, that this issue was about nursing homes. And it turned out that, that, as I said, most of the claims that we're paying today are related to home care. The partnership forced us to go in that direction. Partnership also, in, in a very innovative way, forced us to look at a care management benefit. We knew, like disability insurance, that we make payments under these policies, but what the partnership created was a need for when somebody needs long-term care services, where do they go? And, and from a claims payment perspective, it's really important that somebody have somewhere they can turn to for some care management expertise. The partnership started us down that road, and today that's become a very important part of anything that we do in the world of long-term care. Um, Mark also pointed out expenses. The typical person buying a partnership policy is paying more than the typical person buying a non-partnership policy. Um, the data for the partnership is available on the partnerships website. It's updated every quarter. There's a lot of information there. But again, people who buy these partnership policies keep them, and they know what it is they bought. So I, I just want to summarize here that we think this is a very good program, and this is one of the issues currently with the program. There are only four carriers participating. Uh, if you go to the website, it lists six. Two of those carriers 
have dropped out of the program. So right now, there's only, there are only four carriers in this program. So like the Plan Ahead New York program, we would like to see the state take a second look at the partnership program and say, look, how do we, how do we ramp this program back up? How do we get insurers in the room? How do we get them engaged with the program? We at Genworth think this is a good idea. We prefer that there be more than just four insurers under this program. Claims information. Um, this is something where, when you look at 35 years of experience and what are we learning now, this is our major learning area. Um, we're paying currently uh, $3.4 million on every work day. Our claims people work five days a week. So we're, we're paying about 34,000 active claims any given day, and we're paying $3.5 million on any work, $3.4 million on any work day. For New York State, we paid over $54 million. Um, we, we, we're paying currently to over 2,000 New York policyholders. Um, that's how many policyholders we have currently in claim. Um, as I mentioned, 69%, better than two-thirds of the claims payments we're making are related to home care. This is not an insurance business about nursing homes. This is an insurance business about long-term care. Um, and partnership claims, uh, you know, just sort of a side back, about 12% of our New York claims are related to partnership policies. So those partnership policies today are actually paying off. Um, again, two issues that we've learned with, with, with claims. I can't emphasize enough, when you pay a home care claim, that it has to engage a, a caregiver network. Exactly the same sorts of things Mark was talking about that it's sort of an unsung area. We at Genworth have looked at caregivers out on the table. We've got two studies we've done on caregivers. Um, Genworth has been doing a media campaign. We've actually got a, a Facebook page for caregivers. We look at caregivers as unsung heroes. And, and we run TV ads asking you to nominate caregivers. Um, we just think that this is so important to long-term care services. The other area that I mentioned earlier is Alzheimer's. Um, almost 50% of the dollars that we pay related to long-term care insurance claims is <laughs> Alzheimer's related. It's caused us to become very close with the Alzheimer's Association. And I know here in the state of New York that uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation does fine work as well. But we think that's something else where when you look at where government, in particular the federal government, needs to spend money, it's on Alzheimer's research that you can bring down the major cause of someone needing long-term care by either forestalling Alzheimer's, uh, mitigating the impact of it, or, you know, God bless us all finding a cure for it. Um, my last slide here is sort of, we look at this as, as our long-term care insurance carrier responsibilities. And, and we think that this is a, you know, this is an important business to Genworth Financial. And we think this is a commitment that we're making with our policyholders. Our purpose is to pay claims. And that we, we kind of look at this and say, all right, what do we do to manage risk that puts us as a private insurance company in a position to be able to pay claims? I'm going to kind of walk around here from like, you know, one o'clock on with underwriting. We, from the very beginning in this business, we were a company that underwrote policyholders. There were a number of companies that didn't underwrite. There were a number of companies that issued policies, and then when you filed for a claim, that's when they asked for your medical records. And you read about those stories periodically in front page articles in the New York Times. That's not how we've ever done our business. We have always underwritten, we've always asked for medical records. As we've learned the impact of Alzheimer's, we, we look at some memory tests as part of the underwriting process. So if you get a Genworth policy, that policy is a very conservatively underwritten policy. Um, distribution, you know, how, how do we sell this product? We sell this product in sort of three main ways. Nobody picks up a phone and calls an 800 number. Nobody goes to the internet and says, hey, I want to buy long-term care insurance. It just doesn't work that way, it never has. We sell this product through financial planners. We sell this product through career agents who are uh, agents who only sell long-term care insurance. And we also sell this through endorsed uh, in endorsements. For example, we're the carrier of choice for AARP. 
So the, those are the main ways that we distribute this product. It's trying to reach a qualified audience. It's trying to reach people who are the right age, who have the right income level to be able to afford the product. Uh, and, and making sure you're telling them the right story here, that, that as a financial planner, you're looking at the rest of their portfolio and showing them the risk that they need to mitigate by buying long-term care insurance. Um, claims management expertise. Um, I can't emphasize enough what we're learning and have learned from claims. But when I joined this company, there were three people in our claims operation. Their job was to write checks. It was like a disability insurance model that we thought we were paying claims here to people who had disabilities, that they weren't going to get better, that they were just going to be in a nursing home, and once they got in the nursing home, we'd start sending checks. Our claims operation today involves care management and involves over 300 people in three locations around the country. What we do in claims has become part of our signature, that we believe in taking care of our policyholders, and it isn't just the fact that we pay claims, but it's the fact that when you call our claims operation and they learn that you have a, a, a Genworth policy, um, we send out somebody to the home. Our objective is to get somebody in the home within 72 hours to assess what the situation is, to learn what it is that needs to be developed as part of a plan of care. We're not just sending checks. Um, invested in hedging strategy. When, when you look at long-term care insurance and you kind of ask, what is this? Is this health insurance? Is this life insurance? Is this, what is it? For a long period of time, people looked at long-term care insurance as akin to health insurance. And it's not. Uh, most of the health carriers who wrote this product early on have dropped out of this business. Health insurance, as we all know, gets repriced every year. Um, for anybody here who's signing up for you know, benefits for 2011, chances are your benefits have gone up. Um, your health insurance policy can be repriced every year. Think of long-term care insurance pricing as more akin to life insurance, where somebody's buying this product in their 50s. The typical claimant in this product is in their late 70s or early 80s, so we're going to hold reserves on that policy for 20 years. It's more like term life insurance, where we've got to set aside reserves in order to pay those claims in the future. So our investment strategy, our hedging strategy, is that we've got to match our assets with our liabilities. So we've got to match our reserves with the projected claims that are going to come in 20 years on those policies. Um, experience and in, in, you know, risk insight. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough that our objective is to pay claims, that the learnings that we're seeing today come from the payment of those claims, and that this is what we're embedding into product design and pricing strategy. So that, that when we look at product design, pricing strategies, we're looking at what our experience has been in this business. And we think that the products today are pretty good products, and we would encourage people to consider long-term care insurance as part of their retirement plan.